It's a brand new year. Who would have thought that 2016 would have gone by so quickly? And I know we say that every year, but every year as I'm getting older, it seems like it's January 1st, I blink twice, and it's December 31st. And it seems like the years are just flying by. Let me begin this morning by asking you, how many of you here today would like to have the opportunity for a fresh start? Most of you. Well, I've got great news for you. Today is the first day of a brand new year. You have 365 blank pages in front of you. You've began, began, get it right here in a moment. You've began to write on the first page already as you got out of bed this morning, as you did your routine, as you were faithful in coming to the house of the Lord. Already the year of 2017 has begun for all of us and we have begun to write in there what history is going to tell about us as the Lord tarries. It's a year that's filled with all kinds of opportunities and potential for a new start. And I believe that God is leading us in a time of refreshing. We all have a part to play in it. You know, a major factor in experiencing a new start in our lives is our prayer life. Amen? It's our prayer life. And how many of you understand this morning that prayer is a wonderful privilege? The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that God has opened the door to his throne room and invited his children to enter his presence with their petitions. Jeremiah reminds us again in Jeremiah 33, 3, that God has promised to hear us when we call. Now, I find encouragement in that. How about you? God hears us when we call, regardless of the day, regardless of the hour. God hears us when we call. I'm thankful that he's just as close as the mention of his name. And how many of you can raise your hand together with mine in saying that in the year of 2016, there were times that you called out upon the name of the Lord and thanked the Lord he was there when you called. I want to encourage you in this year of 2017 of believing that we come together as a church and we really put an emphasis on prayer and we are praying with confidence that we can have the assurance of knowing that God will hear us when we call. And most importantly, he has promised to answer our prayers when we pray according to his will is what John tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. So this morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I wanna to speak to you on the subject of praying with confidence. Praying with confidence. I would ask if you would stand with me one more time Let's turn in our Bibles to the 12th chapter of Acts. And we're going to read together verses 1 through 24, a responsive reading. I'll read the first verse and ask if you would be kind enough, please, to read every other verse down through verse 24. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. (laughs) 
And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Isn't that human nature? We pray, we ask God for something, and when God does it, we say, nah, you're just imagining it. It can't be real. It was too big of a need. I mean, I know we serve a big God. I know we serve a God who specializes in the impossible. I mean, we say it all the time. But when God does it, we're astonished. We're in amazement. It, it's as though we, we can't believe that God actually came through. Listen, my friend, God answers prayer. Did you hear what I'm saying? God answers prayer. God hears us when we call. We can pray with confidence and know that our God is able to do what man deems to be the impossible. To God, it's an everyday occurrence. Praise the Lord. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So on a day... On a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. May the Lord add his blessing today to the teaching of his word. You may be seated. Friend, I am glad this morning that I can stand here in front of you and tell you that God is a God of brand new opportunities. And when the people of God pray, there is power in both private and corporate prayer. And today I want to share a few truths about the dynamics of prayer. In the passage of scripture that we just read, we have documented proof that good things happen when God's people pray. In this passage of scripture, in verses one through five, we read of attacks being made against the early church's leaders. James, the brother of John, one of Jesus's inner circle, had been put to death by King Herod. And Peter also had been imprisoned and now finds himself sitting on death row awaiting his own execution. You know, the church did not know what the future held. It was a time of turmoil. It was a time of chaos. It was a time of uncertainty. And as a result, there was fear and concern about the future of the church. You know, if the truth of the matter were known, the church today in the 21st century still finds itself in times of trouble. ISIS recently called for attacks on Christian churches throughout the world during the Christmas season. And who would have thought that the United States would abandon its longtime ally, Israel, by abstaining to vote on a UN resolution that called for a change of its borders and an order to stop building settlements in disputed territories. Friend, I am here to tell you today that as the church of Jesus Christ, it is time that we arise and we let it be made known that Jesus Christ is King and Lord of all, and Israel, who is the apple of God's eye, that as American citizens, we will stand together with them. Now, I'm not here to preach politics, but I am smart enough to know the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham. And he said, those who bless you and your descendants, I will bless. And those that curse you and your descendants, I will curse. And friends, America has been blessed because of our friendship and of our alliance with Israel. And God help us if we ever forsake them and turn our back on them. We must never think that we are immune from attacks from without and within. As long as Satan is allowed to live in this world, he will do everything in his power to disturb and disrupt the harmony and the effectiveness of Christ's church. 
Friend, we live in a world that has a growing segment that is hostile to our message, first in words, and now it's being demonstrated in actions. Oh, it's time for the church to realize that we are involved in spiritual warfare, amen? There is a spiritual war that is going on for your soul and for mine, for the souls of my children and for your children and your grandchildren and my grandchildren. It is time that we awake and realize that there is power in prayer and we can effectively bind those chains of darkness and see them broken and see Jesus Christ prevail as we uplift his name above every other name. Spiritual warfare that goes unchecked by prayer leads to battles taking form in both flesh and blood. And we must battle spiritual warfare with prayer first before hearts and nations can be changed. I believe with all of my heart this morning that prayer must be a priority in every Christian's life. Prayer must be a priority in every Christian's life. I'm thankful for my godly heritage. And some of my fondest memories are when I was a small child growing up my mom and my dad taking the time to pray with us before we would go to bed. And then when we became of school age, every morning, and I have to confess to you that when I got into my junior high years and especially my senior high years, I was kind of resentful, but we did not step foot outside of our house to go to school until we had family devotions. My dad would read every morning from the Bible. We would pray together. And so help me, he prayed for every missionary that there was on the face of the earth. When I was old enough to uh, be able to drive, I had a friend that would come. He's been here to visit a couple of times, Julius, who would come to pick me up, and he would be out there in the parking lot, and he gave up. He thought I'd already taken the bus sometimes because of, of the length of my dad's prayers. But I'm thankful for those prayers. And it's because of those prayers and the prayers of godly grandparents that I stand before you today that when I went through two years in my life where I'm not proud of it, but I wasn't serving God, it was because of those prayers and walking by my mom and dad's room and my grandmother's rooms and hearing them pray for me. It was that convicting power of God where they said, oh God, speak to Jeff. Oh God, bring him back. And because of that, I stand before you today as a minister of the gospel because of prayers of godly people not giving up. There is something to be said about praying with confidence. And friend, I wanna encourage you today. You may have a wayward son. You may have a wayward daughter. You may have a wayward grandson or granddaughter or, or spouse or whatever the relationship may be. But don't give up because God's not giving up on them. And until he does, don't you give up on them either. Prayer must be a priority in every Christian's life. Here in our text, we find a very tiny word tucked away in verse five that makes a big difference. It's the little conjunction, a three-letter word, but. You know, when we first read this passage of scripture, the situation looks desperate. It looks like Peter might be put to death, but in the face of overwhelming problems, the church bowed its head as one person and called on the name of the living God, Jehovah. The church did not cower in fear, because those who threatened them. The church rather lifted its collective voice and God intervened on their behalf. And there's a valuable lesson here for each and every one of us to learn. I believe that a church's commitment to prayer will determine its destiny. Did you hear what I said? I believe that a church's commitment to prayer will determine its destiny. When we have war room prayer, I want to encourage you to come out and join with us. Thank God for those of you who have participated and thank God for the changes that we see that are taking place. But I want to challenge you today that if you and I will stand together in agreement and stand together in prayer and believe and uplift the needs that are there on that list every week and every day in our lives as we take it before the throne of grace, I believe that we're going to see God answering prayer on even a grander scale. Now let's take a moment to examine the prayer of this early church because it's the kind of prayer that we all should be offering up as a church body. As we read this passage of scripture, I believe that there are three things that become apparent to us. First of all, we need fervent prayer. We are told in the King James Version that in verse five, prayer was made without ceasing. And when applied to prayer, it's a picture of fervency, it has the idea of going beyond the boundaries, people pouring their hearts in prayer before the Lord as they seek his face for their needs. Friends, that's the kind of prayer that we need to undertake. 
Seeking the face of God on behalf of our needs, pouring out our hearts, not using eloquent words, not trying to impress others with our, with our vocabulary or, or, or trying to impress God, but rather I am just putting it out on the line. It reminds me of the prayer that little Johnny offered in a Sunday school class after hearing the needs of his classmate and they were heavy duty. And then his teacher said, Johnny, will you pray? And the little Johnny simply said, help. You know, there's a lot of times in my life where that, that word just best sums it up. Help God. This is bigger than I am. God, this is more than I know how to put into, to, to, uh, into words and to articulate. And, and God, I don't know how to go about it. Help God, I need you. There is no other solution. There is no other source of strength. There is no other person that I can turn to. Only you, God, help. Help. The promise of God that we read about in James chapter five, verse 16 is this. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. And I believe that applies to women as well. The words effectual fervent refers to energetic passionate prayer. It is not a prayer that is mundane. It is not a prayer that is done out of habit. It is not a prayer done out of, of, of just because it's expected of me. It's not a prayer that is sluggish, that is lifeless, that is unconcerned or even half-hearted. But rather, it is a prayer that pours forth from a burdened heart. Oh, friend, when was the last time that you carried a burden for an unsaved loved one, unsaved neighbor, unsaved coworker, unsaved community? When was the last time that you shed a tear over Harrisonburg, over Rockingham County, or the respective town in which you live or city in which you live, where you genuinely cared that there were people that were lost and dying and on their way to hell? That kind of prayer, when it pours forth from a burdened heart, reaches heaven and moves the hand of God. Not only do we need fervent prayer, but we also need faithful prayer. By faithful, I mean that the prayer that they offered up was a prayer of faith. Their prayers were made to God, no one else. They were praying to God. They recognized that Peter was in dire straits. They recognized it was going to take a miracle. They recognized that they needed more than human intervention. They needed supernatural intervention. How many times in your life and in mine do we find ourselves in need of God's supernatural intervention on behalf of a situation? But I'm thankful that God hears the cries of his children and God responds to the calls of his people and we can have the assurance of knowing that he's just as close as the mention of his name, praise God. Now this may seem obvious when we say their prayers were made to God. You know, there are times when it seems like our prayers are designed to be heard by other people. However, this congregation joined their voices and they reached up as one to touch God for their church and on behalf of their friend Peter. Friends, when we pray, we must pray in faith because faith is the essential ingredient that marks the difference between answered and unanswered prayer. I remind you that when we pray, we're not just praying to anyone, but we're talking to our Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're talking to our Father, Daddy God. That's who we're talking to. And listen, those of you that are fathers, like I am, when your child is talking to you, what do you do? You listen. When you know that there's, there's a need that is there, as a good, loving father, you do your best to provide for that need, even before it's voiced, but, but you still like to be asked from time to time, do you not? Moms, you have a special place as well. You, you hear the, the cry of a child far better than a dad as they're younger and even the voice of the child as they grow older. But I want you to know there's something about knowing that God is our Father, that as we call out, knowing that he hears our prayers. He delights in hearing and answering the prayers of his children. When we pray, we must pray in faith. Because faith is the essential ingredient that marks the difference between answered and unanswered prayer. Luke 12, 32 tells us that he delights in hearing, and not only in hearing, but answering our prayers. Now, how many of you know that when your prayers are answered, it has a way of building up your faith, doesn't it? As you see God moving on your behalf, and you see God moving in the supernatural, you see God doing the miraculous, I don't know about you, but I get encouraged. I'm reminded of, of, of recognizing the truth and the reality of God's word where he says, I am the God that healeth thee. 
I am reminded of the fact that I am the God that is your shepherd. If you have a need, I will provide for you. I am your Jehovah Shalom, your God of peace, hallelujah, that when you're going through tumultuous times, when you're going through times where you don't have answers and events have, have hit you and, and blindsided you, and you find yourself laying there on your back gasping for air in a figurative sense because of what's come along, I want you to know that I can stand in the midst of those storms and say, peace be still, and there's a peace, there's a tranquility that settles over you, and you know that because God is there somehow, some way, it's going to be okay. When we pray, we're praying to our Father. We also discover here there's a third need of prayer. And that is that when we pray, we need focused prayer. Notice the words in verse 5 where it says, But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. In other words, Peter was the focus of the prayer meeting. They came together for a specific purpose. It wasn't generalized prayer that sought to cover everyone and everything, but rather this was a specific prayer that sought God's intervention for a specific need. Now, if we don't pray specific prayers, how will we ever know when, when God answers? Amen? If all of our prayers are generalized or whatever, how do we know when God answers? But if I'm specific, if I'm praying for an individual that has a particular need in their life and, and believing that God's going to divinely intervene on their behalf, and when I see the answer to that prayer, I can thank God that God heard, that God was attentive, that God is working, and God is faithful in honoring his word. It encourages me. It strengthens me. It builds me up. It makes me want to pray even more about other situations and other individuals in my life. When we ask God for specific needs... And he answers, it glorifies him and increases our faith. Friends, we need to pray specifically for the ministry gifts to be functioning at full capacity here at HFA and other churches in the valley. For the past several weeks, we've been speaking on the different giftings that God has given to the church that are found there in Ephesians chapter 4 and how God is desiring for them to function and flow together that indeed he might pour out his spirit in a mighty way and we might see wonderful things begin to happen in the body of Christ as we reach out into the whitened field of harvests. I encourage you to pray and ask God to help you to not only to discover your gift, but also how he would desire for you to use it. Ask God to stretch you out of your comfort zone and grow you into a mature individual that will mentor others in discovering and using their giftings. And as we are working together, that we can truly see this church become what God is desiring for it to become, one of many churches in this valley that will become a soul-saving station, that will become a church that will indeed disciple others, and that we will make an impact on the kingdom of hell as we literally march in and take back that which the devil has tried to destroy. I believe that this will take place when you and I pray. Oh, we pray a lot, but how many times do we really spend specifically praying for others? Right now, there are people in our church who are facing life-threatening illnesses. Let's be touching heaven on their behalf. Let's not just pray for them on Sunday morning, but oh, friends, I, I pray that you understand the importance of, of being a church family. I care about my flesh and blood. And even though you and I aren't flesh and blood related, you are my brother in Christ. You are my sister in Christ. And I care about you. And I want to encourage you, let's begin praying for one another and believing that as we see God working on behalf of these individuals, answers to our prayers becoming a reality on a daily basis. And let's not be surprised when God does it either. Let's not like be, the, be like the people in that prayer meeting when Rhoda told him, hey, Peter's at the gate. No, Rhoda, uh, bless your heart, sweetheart. We know you love Peter, and, and we know that you thought the world of him, whatever, but, but honey, he's behind bars, and he's got four squadron of soldiers surrounding him. And, and, and not only that, there's so many locked gates between him and there. Sweetheart, I mean, look, I, I know you love them, but it's not really Peter. Then they heard the knocking at the door themselves, and when they went down, what did they discover? Our God is greater than any force on hell, on earth, or in heaven. Our God reigns. Amen? Amen? Amen. Our God reigns. Amen. We can pray. We can pray. And we can believe that as we pray that fervent prayer, that as we pray, indeed, that faithful prayer, that as we pray that focused prayer, we have a guarantee that our prayers are going to be answered. 
There are others who are struggling with needs. There are others in our midst, even now, that are carrying burdens and problems, who stand in need of our prayers. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to know that when you come into church that you're surrounded by people who genuinely care for you. And when they come up and they take your hand and they say, I want you to know I was praying for you this week. You know that they genuinely meant it. It wasn't just verbiage. It wasn't just something to say because you're in church. But you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, they were praying for you. And how do you know it? Because you've seen God's faithfulness throughout the week. And when you came in, you had a word of testimony. You had a word of praise as to how God had answered your prayer. Hallelujah. I encourage you, pull out that bulletin insert that lists the individuals in need daily. If you can't do it daily, then do it as often as you possibly can, but at least once a week. And specifically pray for them by name. If you lose your bulletin, go online to our church website, hfachurch.org, and pull up the prayer list and begin your day with prayer and end your day with prayer and begin expecting God to make the impossible the possible because you are praying with the assurance of knowing that God is hearing and answering prayer and God is moving on your behalf and you are praying with the confidence and assurance of knowing that God is just as close as the mention of his name. You see, friends, our prayers become powerful when you and I are united in our walk with God. What does the word of God tell me? One shall put to flight what? A thousand? Two shall put to flight? Three shall put to flight? Scripture doesn't say that, but it's the law of multiplicity, okay? That's Hezekiah 3.17, in case you were wondering. That's a joke. But listen, this is not a joke. If one can put to flight a thousand... If two can put to flight 10,000, if three can put to flight 100,000, I'm not smart enough to know what a church of 400 people can do, but friends, it's a lot. It's a lot. Come on now, it's a lot. Let's do our part. Don't wait for somebody else to do your praying for you. You get on your knees. You begin seeking the face of God and see what our God can and will do on behalf of the needs of our church as well as in your own personal life. Oh, friends, I want you to understand, and I, I pray that, that you'll get this, this kind of heart, this kind of compassion. As your friend and as your pastor, I want to see people saved. I want to see people healed. I want to see people delivered. I want to see the power of God manifested in our midst. And it will take place. Hear me, I'm saying that to the affirmative. God's given us his personal guarantee. It will take place if we will be people of prayer and we will use the giftings that God has given us and allow them to be blended together under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There is no telling what can happen. And it can be said of the 21st century as it was said of the first century church, these are those who turn their world upside down for the cause of the gospel. If we as a church are going to influence our community for Christ, then prayer must become the foundational characteristic of our existence. Prayer drives us to our knees in dependence on God, reminding us that human effort alone cannot accomplish his purposes. So in conclusion this morning, I want you to understand with me that when the church prayed, God heard, and God answered their prayers. Peter was delivered from prison through a tremendous, miraculous intervention of God. God saved Peter because people prayed and asked him to. I wonder what God might do among us if we dare to pray and pray with expectation and pray with complete confidence in knowing that God can do what you and I sometimes seem to think is the impossible. Our faith doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be exercised. If you don't take anything else away from this sermon today, underline that, circle that, put an asterisk by it, exclamation mark, whatever it is, I hope that this will get your attention. Our faith does not have to be perfect. It just has to be exercised. We're a lot like the father who brought his son to Jesus to have demons cast out. Remember reading about it there as Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration there in Matthew 17? When he came down off the mountain, he saw his other nine disciples there and father had brought forth his son that was possessed by demons and asked them to pray for them and said, Lord, they're not able to cast him out. But he believed that Jesus Christ could do it. But even though he believed it, he still was filled with doubt and fear. 
Jesus told him in Mark 9, 23 through 24, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And he responded, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. May we pray the same prayer. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, I, as a pastor, there have been many times where I've been called upon to pray for different individuals in different situations and whatever. And I know in my heart of hearts, I know that God can do it. But at the same time, I'm being honest and telling you there are times that the flesh kicks in and there's that little bit of doubt that's there. Now, I know none of you ever struggle with that, but I confess to you, I do. And there's that little bit of seed of doubt that's there. And God, I know you're all, all powerful. Lord, I know that you're omniscient. Lord, I know that you're the one who created us. And Lord, I know that you know from beginning to end. And, and Lord, that you are the alpha and the omega. There's nothing that you don't already know the outcome to. You don't have the solution to and whatever. But God, wow, this is really a big thing. And it's in those times that I find myself, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to eradicate that little, little bit of doubt that is there. Because Jesus also went on and told this father, he said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed, and it'll be removed. Friend, I'm here today to tell you that when we pray, it doesn't take faith that's perfect, it just takes faith that needs to be exercised. Lord, help my unbelief. Let's not worry about cultivating big faith, but rather let's concern ourselves with developing profound childlike faith. Amen? Profound childlike faith. Don't worry about cultivating big faith. Let's just put into action the faith that we have. I believe that our God is still the God of miracles. Can you say amen? He's able to do so much more than we have ever seen him do. In Ephesians 3.20, it tells us that. And in 2017, I will pray fervently. I will pray faithfully. And I will pray with a specific focus. And I pray that you will do the same. As our praise team makes their way forward. Friend, I believe that in this year of 2017, that it will be the year that HFA will reach its full potential because we will confidently pray with expectancy. We will pray fervently. That means that we are going to pray constantly. And I don't mean that you have to walk around with your eyes shut on your knees and whatever, but you know what? Throughout the day, we can be praying, can we not? As we are in our workplace, as we're in our home, as we're in our schools, whatever environment you may find yourself in, we can pray with a fervency and constantly and believing that God is hearing and God is acting. And I believe that before the year 2017 draws to an end, should the Lord tarry, we are going to see phenomenal things take place and maybe not be, uh, you know, uh, you know, taken back by it or surprised by it or whatever, but when we just simply say, yes, that's my God. Yes. That's my God. He is honoring his word. We not only will pray fervently or consistently, but we will pray faithfully. Pray with that measure of faith that God has given us, with that childlike faith that is so powerful in knowing that I'm not just praying to anybody, I'm praying to my daddy God. And just like my earthly father, I can count on him, I can count on my heavenly father even more. We will pray specifically, focus that God will use this church fully functioning in his gifts that he has given to each and every one of us. In your bulletin, you'll discover that the Assemblies of God has designated this first week of the year as a week of prayer, praying with confidence. You have the insert there in your bulletin. Everybody see what I'm looking at? Go ahead, pull it out. I wanna encourage you, beginning with today, that you will spend this week praying for our church, our family, our country, and our world. Today, we will pray with faith in Jesus Christ, letting us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of needs, that God will remove my doubts, my fears, my anxieties, and help me to begin to believe for the impossible. Tomorrow, I will pray more effectively in faith, bring your needs before God and pray according to his will. On Tuesday, 
I will pray consistently. Ask God to help you to develop and practice a daily habit of prayer and give you a desire to know Christ more deeply. On Wednesday, I can pray with authority, pray with a boldness, believing for the power of God to be released, that miracles and healings will occur, pointing many to Jesus Christ. On Thursday, I will pray in the Spirit. Ask God to fill you with this Holy Spirit as you intercede for spiritual breakthroughs in your life, in your family, in your community. On Friday, pray and petition to God. Ask God to replace your fears with faith and trust him for specific areas of concern in your life. And then on Saturday, I will persist in prayer. Pray for strength to persist in prayer regarding challenges before you, critical needs, the salvation of friends and family members, remembering that all things are possible with God. Friends, pray confidently. And then when it's Sunday again, start all over again. Amen? I know they call it a week of prayer, but friends, it doesn't mean that it's just January 1st through January 7th. I believe that if you and I will take this to heart, and I believe that if you will join with me in prayer, and I pledge to you that I will do this, I'll never ask you to do something I won't do myself, but I challenge you, join with me in prayer, and let's see what our God will do when we as a church begin to pray with confidence. Bow your head with me in prayer, please. God, today, as we're beginning a brand new year, what better place to begin it than in your house? I believe today that, Lord, prayer breaks the chains of fear, breaks the chains of doubt, breaks the chains of what man deems to be the impossible to become the possible. Lord, as we have countless examples given to us in your word of where when the people of God or the man of God or the woman of God came to you seeking your face, Lord, with, with a compassionate prayer, a prayer that came from the heart, a prayer that laid aside, Lord, all the trappings of, of religion and, and all the frill and all the fanciness of eloquent words. And Lord, they just bared their heart and they said, God, help, help. It was then that we saw your faithfulness, Lord, intervening. We saw that with our God, nothing is impossible. And so, Lord, we're believing in this year of 2017, for the impossible to become the possible here at HFA. As you raise up even more prayer warriors, God, and thank you for the ones that we have, and Lord, for those who are potential prayer warriors, I pray even now, stir that gift that is within them, and Lord, may they yield it, may they surrender it, may they use it for your glory as we work together under the headship of Jesus Christ to impact our community in this year of 2017. God, we need you can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own wisdom. We need your guidance. But Lord, most of all, on our part, there needs to be a submissiveness. There needs to be a willingness, not just giving lip service, but Lord, that we will take this message to heart today and become an even more fervent in our prayers. And we will be even more faithful in our prayers. And Lord, that we will be focused, specifically mentioning needs and then believing to see what our God can do. I'm reminded today, Lord, that when Moses and the Israelite children were standing before the Red Sea in front of them, and the armies of Pharaoh behind them, and the people were disgruntled and murmuring and blaming Moses for their despair and the discouragement that they found themselves facing. It was then that you said, tell the people to stand still and see what their God can and will do. So today, Lord, as we pray, may we truly indeed look to you and see what our God can and will do for those who call out upon your name, knowing that you're always attentive to the cries of your children. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this morning, my friend, if you're here, and as you're beginning this new year, you recognize your need of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. God's been speaking to you throughout this message, and you recognize that one of the prayers that God hears is the prayer of the sinner. We're all sinners, all in need of God's saving grace and redemption. There was a time in my life when I prayed and asked Christ for forgiveness of my sins, 
Maybe today you find yourself in that same situation. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, I simply would ask right now in the privacy of this moment, you simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm lost. But today, I no longer want to be a prodigal. I want to be a child of God. I want to call out upon his name and receive this wonderful gift of eternal life. If that's you, would you simply raise your hand? We might pray together with you. Anyone at all? Yes, I see that hand. You may put it down. Is there another? Yes, I see that hand. You may put it down. Another? You need Jesus today? God is speaking to you? Two hands have gone up. Is there yet another? Perhaps you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I pray, but I don't pray enough. And today, with God's help, I'm going to do my best to improve my prayer life. I'm reluctant to say that I'm going to pray every day because it doesn't just happen, but I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to give it my best effort. I want to be one of those that you can count on, to stand together with you and believing that as we pray, asking these things in the name of Jesus, and we're praying it with confidence, we're praying it with the assurance of knowing that our God hears and answers prayer, I'm expecting great things in 2017. If that's you, raise your hand. Yes, hands are going up all over. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Would you stand together with me to your feet? I'm going to ask if you would as a congregation to pray together with me the following prayer. It's going to be a twofold prayer. Two individuals have raised their hands this morning, expressing their need of receiving Jesus Christ into their life. You may already be a born-again believer. You may already know Christ as your Savior. But can we do this by way of a rededication? On the first day of the year, the Lord, I'm rededicating my life to you. And then secondly, we're going to pray that God will give us the ability to become more fervent in our prayers, that we will pray prayers of faith and they will be focused, specific prayers and believing that God will hear and bring it about that we can stand and give testimony as an encouragement to others around us who have yet to receive the answer to their prayers. Isn't that great? Isn't that a wonderful resolution to make? I will pray. Can you think of a better resolution than that for the new year? I will pray. With God's help, I will pray. You have the list there in front of you. Don't just tuck it away in your pocketbook or in your pocket mint or worse yet in foul 13. If you don't know what foul 13 is, that's your trash can. But carry it around with you. And let's really see what our God will do when we join together in prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Repeat after me. Dear Lord, I come today in need of your saving grace. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself, but thank you, Lord. You paid the price for my sins on the cross of Calvary. I ask right now for you to come into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Wash away my every sin. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life that I may know I am your child. You are my God. I love you, Lord. I want to serve you. Give me the ability through the help of your Holy Spirit to remain true to you, to walk in faithfulness, in obedience, that you will be my Lord, my Savior, my Master, and my soon coming King. Thank you for hearing my prayer and saving my soul and giving me this wonderful gift of eternal life. And Lord, today, with your help, help me to be a person of prayer. May I not just start out well, but may I be consistent in my prayer life, beginning my day in prayer, living my day in prayer, ending my day in prayer, that I may see your faithfulness unfolding around me. May you receive all glory and honor as we pray with confidence, believing that the impossible will become the possible. We thank you for this, Lord. It's with great expectation that we look forward to what the year 2017 will hold. To God be all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we give a clap offering to the Lord this morning? <laughs> glory to God. Glory to God.
Remember, friends, it doesn't take great faith. It just takes putting the faith that you have and putting it into action. I believe that if we'll do that, there's no telling what our God can and will do. I'm excited. How about you? Are you excited? Well, let's not just allow it to be excitement. Let's put that excitement into action and see the faithfulness of the Lord unfolding. Our praise team is coming to lead us in a closing song. I pray that you'll have a wonderful 2017. Just by way of reminder, if you purchased a poinsettia, please feel free to take that home with you today. Also, there are some Christmas cards out in the church mailboxes. Uh, the first letter of your last name is the box that you want to look under. And uh, those Christmas cards don't do me a bit of good if they don't say Jeff or Bonnie Ferguson on them. So uh, I encourage you to check your mail before you go. May God richly bless you. And I pray that this year of 2017 is going to be filled with God's joy, with God's peace, and God's faithfulness on behalf of each and every one of you. God bless you. Happy New Year.